Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Is anybody excited to be at church this morning? That's good. Now, I expect you to be a little louder than first service. Is that a, is that a fair assumption that I'm going to expect you to be a little louder, a little more engaged? If you're taking notes this morning, because note takers are world changers, the title is God's Plan. God's Plan. Now, maybe you've heard this saying before, and if you've heard this, finish the sentence. Some things in life you have to do on your on your own, right? Who believes this statement to be true? Some things in life you got to do on your own. If you don't believe this, let me give you some examples. When you turn 16, or when you're going to turn 16, and you go to get your driver's license, if you show up with four or five of your friends, that's not going to work to take the driver's license test with four or five friends. And besides, if you were to be able to take it with a bunch of friends, we all know that one friend that really shouldn't have their driver's license that now is just going to get it because they're following you along, right? Because some things in life you got to do on your own. Going to the gym with friends can be great, right? I mean, maybe you're like, uh, going to the gym at all sounds horrible. But going to the gyms with friends can be good, right? You can, but you can go to the gym and you can have matching outfits. You can take a bunch of selfies in the mirror. You can even spot everyone. You could go around the gym spotting every person that's lifting weights in the gym. But unless you lift the weight on your own, unless you eat the right way, you're not going to get the results you want because some things in life you have to do on your own. Next month we'll make three years of marriage for Marin and I. Uh, I'm, yep. How, how blessed is she, right? Just kidding. I'm married up. We all know that. But how crazy would it have been if three and a half, four years ago when I went to propose, if I called up Pastor Luke, I'm like, hey, Luke, bro, I need you to go and propose to Marin for me, man. Can can you do that for me? Right? That would be crazy. First of all, if he said yes, that would be a weird friend. He's like, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll go propose for you. That's great. Right? That'd be crazy. And, and who knows that if that did happen, I'd be in a doghouse before it was even built for me, right? Because some things in life you have to do on your, on your own. How many know we serve a God where some things in our walk with God we have to do on our own? No one else can do holiness for you. No one else can be obedient for you. No one else can worship for you. Anybody here like to worship this morning, right? No one else can praise God. No one else can shout to God for you. Anybody like to shout to God this morning, right? No one else can fulfill the purpose that God has for you, for you. Now here at, here at New Hope, we, we, are, we are a community. We, we have a family, and within that, within that, Uh, that's great to walk along our our walk with God together, but within that, God has an individual purpose for each and every one of us, a certain thing that he is asking you to carry out. And he says, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be my follower, carry your cross daily. Touch your neighbor on the shoulder and say daily. Make sure they're awake. Don't be weird about it, all right? Will, don't be weird about it. I I don't want to see like you rubbing them on the shoulder like daily. Like, that's just, that's just creepy. Don't give them a massage. Just make sure they're awake daily, all right? Don't be weird about it. But this can be a confusing statement, right? The, the daily can be confusing because if Jesus already defeated the cross, if, if Jesus has, has already defeated it, if we sing songs about Jesus defeating the cross, if we see that, that Jesus said, it is finished, then why do I have to carry my cross daily? Why, if, if it's already finished, why do I have to do that daily? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because we need, it's important to see what he's talking about when he's saying we need to carry our cross. First, we know that, that the cross was, was a brutal way of, of execution for someone. This was, this was not something that you would just have a conversation with uh, someone else about during this time. This would be like today, us, us having a conversation with someone about the electric chair, right? If you're having just normal conversations with someone about electric chair, like I question what kind of friends you have. Like that, that's, kind of, that's kind of interesting. This is not something at this time where they would have gold crosses around their neck that they would wear as necklaces. This would be like us having little gold electric chairs around our necklace and just walking around, right? That would be weird. Right? So this, this was a means of death that, that people would talk about. So when he's saying that, that we need to pick up our cross, he's saying we need to die to ourselves. We need to die to our selfish desires, die to the things that, that we want for ourselves. I think it's also important to bring up the point that the cross was Jesus' purpose. The cross was his purpose. We know that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And in order to, to save us, he, he had to die for us. So he's saying, he's saying, you gotta pick up your cross. You have to pick up your purpose. You see on the screen, the definition of purpose is this, the reason for which something is created or for which something exists. Now, I wanna change out the word something to the word you. 
the reason for which you are created, the reason for which you exist. How many know that, that you were created for a purpose? How many know that, that we weren't just, we're not just here by chance? We, it's, there's not some big bang that happened. There's not some sort of evolution thing that happened, and you're just by chance here. You're here with a purpose. God created you and formed you to be you. You have a purpose. God has a plan for you, and if you, if you don't leave here with anything else, leave here knowing that, that you have a purpose. But so often, we treat our purposes like we treat our hobbies. I'll get to it when I get to it. I'll get to it when I, when I have enough money. I'll get to it when, when the kids are out of the house. I'll get to it when work slows down. But if what you're doing on a daily basis is not working to fulfill your purpose, it's not only taking up your time, but it's a waste of your time. If, what, if what's going on on a daily basis is not pushing you towards your purpose, is not working to fulfill the purpose God has planned for you, it's not just taking up your time, but it's just a waste of time. You have to realize that you are here on purpose for a purpose. And Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be my follower, you have to do it daily. He doesn't say, if you want to be my, my, my disciple, if you want to be my follower, do it Sunday mornings. To do, do it whenever the church doors are open. He's saying, do it daily. You have a purpose. Make sure your other neighbor's awake. Touch them on the shoulder and say, purpose. Tell your neighbor, you have a purpose. It's important to know this. No matter how long you've gone to church, whether you've gone your entire life or this morning is your first time ever in church, God has a purpose for your life. And maybe you're here this morning and you're you're claiming to be a Christian. And and I think it's important we know what this word Christian means. A a Christian is a Christ follower, right? And in this this verse, he's saying, if you want to be my follower, do it daily. All right? Let's try that again. If you want to be my follower, do it Daily. daily. Not saying if you don't be my follower, do it Sunday mornings, do it when it's easy, do it when you've got time, do it when work slows down. Saying do it daily. This is something that we have to do daily. Being a Christian is being a Christ follower. Saying that you're a Christian because you go to church is like saying that you're a mechanic because you're standing in a garage with a broken down car, right? You, 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 could, you could be in there, and you could, uh, you could even have the knowledge on how to fix it. You could have gone to school to learn how to fix a car. You could have the whole book right there. You could know every single thing there is to do to fix your broken car. But unless you actually fix it, are you a mechanic, right? Calling yourself a Christian because you go to church would be like going into the kitchen and calling yourself a chef, right? Who knows? I can make mac and cheese, but that doesn't really make me a chef, right? I can have all the ingredients. I could have the nicest kitchen, all, all, the, all the nicest materials in there. I could have the perfect recipe. I could even have the recipe memorized. But unless I actually make the food, I'm not a chef. I, I'm not creating anything. You're not a Christian because you receive information. You're a Christian because of what you do with that information. You're not a Christian because you just sit there and receive it. You're a Christian because of what you do with it. And he's saying, follow me daily. What's your purpose? What, what, what's, the, what's the purpose God has for you? Is it to be a pastor? Is it to be a worship leader? Is it to be an author, a lawyer, a, a teacher, a, a business owner, a stay-at-home parent? Regardless of what it is, everyone needs to understand that you were created with a purpose. And he's saying, I want you to carry out that purpose daily. So all of us have an have a exact purpose that God has given us. All of us have, have something that God's called us to do. But outside of that exact purpose that God's given us as a whole, we have a purpose that God's given us as, as a church, as, as a family, as, as Christians, as Christ followers, and it's the Great Commission. Go into the world and make disciples. And so, so Jesus commands us, go and make disciples. So by us not going and making disciples, it's almost as if we're, we're sinning against him, right? So he, he tells us, go and make disciples. But how many know that, that sometimes you can know your purpose, you can know what God's called you to do, you can know the plans that he has for you, but sometimes you begin to shift away from that. And, and you know it, and, and you might do something that, that's kind of similar, but you slowly start to shift away from that. There's a story that, that David uh, Platt uses in his book, Radical, uh, about the SS United States, and I want to just share this with you. You'll see a picture of the ship up on the screen. But it says this, in the late 1940s, the United States government constructed an $80 million troop carrier for the Navy. The purpose was to design a ship that could speedily carry 15,000 troops during times of war. 
By 1952, construction on the SS United States was complete. The ship could travel at, at about 51 miles per hour, and she could steam 10,000 miles without stopping for fuel or supplies. She could outrun any other ship and travel nonstop anywhere in the world in less than 10 days. The SS United States was the fastest and most reliable troop carrier in the world. The only catch is she never carried any troops, at least at any official capacity. Instead, the SS United States became a luxury liner for presidents, heads of states, and a variety of other celebrities who traveled on her during her 17 years of service. As a luxury liner, she couldn't carry 15,000 people. Instead, she could house just under 2,000 passengers. Those passengers could enjoy the luxuries of, of 695 staterooms, four dining salons, three bars, two theaters, five acres of open deck with a heated pool, 19 elevators, and the fir world's first fully air-conditioned passenger ship. Instead of a vessel used for battle during wartime, the SS United States became, became a means of indulgence for wealthy patrons who desired to coast peacefully across the Atlantic. Things look radically different on a luxury liner than they do, do a troop carrier. The faces of soldiers preparing for battle and those of patrons enjoying their snacks are radically different. The conservation of resources on a troop carrier contrasts sharply with the abundance that characterizes the luxury liner. And the pace at which the troop carrier moves is by necessity much faster than the luxury liner. After all, the troop carrier has an urgent task to accomplish. The luxury liner on the hand is free to casually enjoy the ship. Let me introduce the thought to you that the SS United States is the American church. Unfortunately, most churches in America resemble the luxury liner. Although God designed us to carry soldiers into battle, we've become more interested in our own comforts during the journey, so much so that we've actually quit moving toward the battle. When you attend a service at the average church in America, you typically hear more about the programs and amenities you can find on the ship than you do about the mission of which is ahead. I guess it is what it says it is, a service. Like the staff on a cruise ship, the church is there trying to serve its members. Unfortunately, those members are selfishly getting fed and consuming those services when they should be thinking in terms of being transformed and trained by the gospel so they can accomplish the mission of serving the world with the gospel. On the other hand, what if the church was coming together to equip its members, its troops, to take ground for the kingdom of God? What if we didn't have services, but instead we have training exercises? What if we removed the luxuries from church and focused on the mission? What if we saw our ultimate goal as sending troops into the world rather than catering to the whims of our members? What would it take to convert the luxury liners we, we have into troop carriers again? If we were to return to our troop carrying calling, would the church be able to accommodate 15,000 soldiers who shared space or 2,000 patrons fighting for position in space? If we focused on this calling, would the church move at a faster, unhindered by petty internal arguments? Listen, we have a calling. We, we, we have a purpose, but unfortunately, we've become lazy. We, we've become lazy, and this is what Satan wants. He, he wants for us to be lazy, and he's convinced us of this lie that, that I'm not lazy, I'm just relaxing. And as Americans, we're so good at relaxing. We're so good at creating me time. We're so good at being comfortable. But comfort zones don't keep your life safe. They, they keep your life small. We need to understand that, that a comfort zone is not going to keep you safe. It just keeps your life small. You can't do something great while you're, while you're comfortable. It takes being uncomfortable. It takes being pushed out of your comfort zone in order to do something great for God's kingdom. So maybe you're in this place where you're saying, you know what, I, I'm stuck in this place of being comfortable. I'm stuck in a place where I'd rather watch Netflix than read my Bible. I'd rather hang out with my friends than, than go and reach someone new. I'd rather just sit at home than go into the world. How do I get out of this place? And it's this word called compassion. Because the more you care, the more you will risk. The more you care, the more you will lay your life down. Think about the things that you are willing to endure if your heart is truly to reach lost people. Think about the things that, that you would go through. Think about the shame that you would go through if your heart is to reach lost people. Think about all the people that, that would speak down to you if our heart really is to reach lost people. Compassion. Anybody here ever seen inside a fire truck before? Anybody looked inside a fire truck? Now correct me if I'm wrong, but last time I saw inside a fire truck, I didn't see a massage chair, all right? Can you imagine, hey, I'm not going to go fight this fire unless I have a nice massage on my way to go fight it. Said no fireman ever, right? Because the point in a fire truck is not comfort. It's how do I get from where I'm at to the fire? How do I get from where I'm at to save the person that, that might be dying the fastest? Lazy boys are important. Humvees, they're rugged. 
Paramedics, they, they, they don't have a big comfy ride. It's not about a comfy ride along the way. It's about the stretcher that's in the back. We need to kill the idea that church is a place to be comfortable. We need to kill this idea that, that church is a place to be comfortable because comfort in church causes barrier to living for eternal things. Comfort in church causes barrier to living out the purpose that God has for your life. We need, to, we, we need to leave this place of being comfortable and start being compassionate. As we give to missions this next year, we just had our, our big missions convention a few weeks ago. We just talked about what we did for, for missions. And, but I challenge you, if the, if the amount of money that you're giving to missions doesn't make you uncomfortable, maybe we're doing it wrong. If, if that person that, that, that we have been talking to, if, that, if there's people that, that were saying, okay, I'll invite this person to church, I'll, I'll tell this person about Jesus, if that's comfortable, may, maybe we're not talking to everyone that we should be. Maybe we're doing that wrong. We need to leave this place uh, of being comfortable and start being compassionate. We need, we need to, to say, God, I'm not comfortable, but I am compassionate. I am going to be aggressive because you came to the world to save me and to save them, and they need to hear about that. Listen, the cross, the cross wasn't comfortable, but you know what there was on the cross? There was compassion. Amen. It's not a comfortable place, but it's full of compassion. And hear this this morning, that church does not exist for you. Church doesn't exist for us. Why? What do you mean it doesn't exist for us? This is my church that I go to. This is the place I come to on Sunday mornings. I understand that, but it doesn't exist for us because we are the church and we exist for the lost. And this changes, this changes how we do church. This changes when you come into church on a Sunday morning. It changes of me just getting to my seat and me going through the day and then leaving to, to now I'm going to try to meet someone new. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out of my comfort zone. I'm going to talk to other people. This changes how we worship. I don't worship because it's the style I like, because it's the team I like, because it's the song I like, because the lights are just right. I worship because God is good and he deserves my worship. Come on. We need to kill this idea that, that this is a place to be comfortable and recognize that there's going to be styles I don't like. Listen, if, if we were to do worship just for the youth on, on a Sunday morning and do Hillsong Young and Free, you guys might be all jacked up and ready to go. But there's someone that might come in that that's not quite their style, and they might leave because that's not their style, and now they don't have a chance to respond to Jesus. We, we could come in and we could do hymns for the whole Sunday morning, and, and some people would be fired up about that. But someone else might come in and say, you know, this isn't my style, this isn't for me, and they might leave. We need to be at a place where we say, you know what? This is a, a multi-generational church. This is a multi-generational thing, and so, if it means someone else hearing about Jesus, then I'm okay being a little uncomfortable. I believe that there are many people in this room who know their calling. You know the purpose that God has for you, but you've been delaying it. You, you, you've been procrastinating it and fighting it because you know what that calling means, because you know what it means to, to live out that calling. You've been stalling that calling and right now, you're comfortable in your job, right? Right now, you, you're involved in some things. You, you, have some, you have some excuses like, God, God, I'm not old enough. I'm not old enough to do that. God, I'm too old. God, I don't have enough money. God, God my past is too broken. God, my, my past is too bad for, for me to do this. God, God, just wait till, wait till I get this and this ready, and then I'll do that. God, I'm not ready yet. Well, guess what? You are ready the moment you declare Jesus as Lord of your life. We need to understand that it's not, it's not us that can do all these things. It's not, it's not by my power and strength, but it's by God. God's grace will enable you. He'll strengthen you to go out into the world. And we, we see that, that many times, we, maybe this morning you're here and, and you feel called to something. Maybe that's, maybe that's to be a missionary. You, you feel called to be a missionary, and, and you're, you're ready. Everything's ready to go, but, but it, you're scared about it, and, and you're nervous about it, and, you, and you've been delaying it, and you've been postponing it. And instead of, of going into the mission field, you're going to say, well, you know what? I know that's what God has for me, but maybe I'll just teach Sunday school. Maybe I'll just help on a Wednesday night, which don't get me wrong. Those are great things, but partial obedience is still disobedience. Partial obedience is still disobedience. You, you can partially be obeying God, but you're still disobeying God. We need, we need to be a place where we say, God, wherever what you want me to go, I will go. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. I will be obedient. And we get stuck in this place, and we say this, and we hear this all the time, that God won't give you more than you can handle. Listen, if I'm the only one who has stuff more than I can handle, then maybe I'll just step on down and someone else can come up and preach. But I have a seventh-month-old son at home, and let me tell you, God's given me more than what I can handle. Amen. <laughs> right? He's going to get, we, we get more than we can handle all the time, but through God, all things are possible. 
Through God, he will strengthen me. You can't get over that addiction. You can't get over that temptation. You can't fix your marriage. But guess what? I know someone who can. God can do that. God, God will do that through you. And maybe this morning you're, you're feeling called and you recognize the purpose that, that God's put on you. And you're, you're getting fired up and you're ready to go live that purpose out. But let me give you some warnings because the moment that you begin to, to walk out your purpose is the moment that Satan's going to come and try to distract you and destroy you. In other words, the moment you begin to walk it out, say, or your haters will begin to come out. The moment you walk it out, haters will come out and they, they will speak down to you. And here's what that looks like. That's not someone that, that, that's just some random person off the street coming up and, and saying stuff to you. That's someone that you're close to. It, it's someone that you care about, someone, someone that you've loved that, that's now trying to distract you and destroy you from that. But in those moments, you need to rely on the words that God has spoken to you, not on the words that man tries to throw your way. This is, why, this is why I say things like note takers are world changers because if you're taking notes, if you're journaling as you go through devotions, you can reference what God has spoken to your life and you can't, that way you won't get distracted with what the world has said to you otherwise. Rely on what God's spoken to you and worship team, you can come on up. The fact is, is that as you begin to walk out your purpose, as you begin to live out your purpose, others won't understand. They won't, they won't get it. They, they, they never will understand. They won't understand why you left that job that paid so well to take on that internship, why you left that job to, to go into the mission field. They won't understand why you gave away so much money, why, why you gave away that, that car. They won't understand. They won't understand why you open up your house for small groups because Monday night used to be poker night, but, but now it's small group night. They, they won't understand, but they never will. They, they, they never will understand because the only one we need to understand is God. But Jesus says, if, if they challenge me, they're going to challenge you. If, if they hate me, they're, they're going to hate you. And I imagine as Jesus is on his way to get crucified, walking through the crowd and people yelling at him from all over, that it wasn't just the people that hated him all along yelling at him. I imagine that there was someone there that, that saw the woman with bleeding healed. Says, you know what? I, I was there when you did that. And I'm not quite sure how you did that, but look at you now. You're, you're a nobody. There's someone there that, that maybe had benefited from the, from the loaves of bread and the fish and said, you know what? That was a good fish sandwich. But look at you now. You're not the Messiah. You're, you're a fraud. And, and people will come that, that, that you think that are on your side. But this gospel gives us a great example of what it looks like to carry your cross. In Mark 15, we, we saw this man named Simon. And, and, and he, he picks up this cross, and some say that he's doing Jesus a favor. And maybe some say, oh, poor Simon, you, you feel bad for Simon. He's probably just on his way, you know, to go get some groceries, to, to go to work. And, and on his way, there's all this crowd, there's all this commotion going on. And he, and he tries to get through to see what's going on. He gets up there only to see, see Jesus on the ground on the cross laying there, and the soldiers grab him and force him to carry this cross. And maybe you feel bad for Simon because he was just going through a normal day. And what's crazy is that this guy that we've never heard of before becomes a key character in this story. You see, for Simon, it was just another normal day. And what he didn't know was that this was going to be the worst day in history and the best day in history. The worst day because it's the day that man decided to, to kill God. It's the best day because it's the day that God decided to kill death. But for Simon, it was just a normal day. And maybe you came in here this morning and it's just a normal day. You expected just to go to church and to check it off your to-do list. But hear me, today could be your day. Today could be the day that God speaks to you. Today could be the day that things begin to change, that you begin to live out that purpose. Today could be that day. It's not just a normal day. And a disciple says, I will be obedient. A disciple says, where you want me to go, I will go. What you want me to do, I will do. That's what a follower says. That's what, that's what a Christian says. But can you imagine... As Simon's grabbed from the crowd and the, and the cross is put on his back and he begins to walk up the path through the, through the crowd, poor Simon, right? It was just a normal day for him. It was just going through, he's going to go get groceries and he gets forced to carry Jesus' cross. Or was it the opposite? See, I don't think Simon ever carried Jesus' cross. I don't think Simon even touched what could have been Jesus' cross. I think it's important we realize who carried whose cross. Simon didn't carry Jesus' cross. Jesus carried Simon's cross. And thief one's cross, and thief two's cross, and your cross, and my cross, and every bad guy's cross, and every good guy's cross. 
Jesus carried the cross. And what we see in this moment is the gospel. Simon is carrying the cross that he should have died on. Simon wasn't a perfect guy. He, he, he had struggles, and he was carrying the cross that he should have died on, that, that he should have paid the punishment for, for his sin on. But in that moment, a transaction takes place. In that moment, a robbery happens where Jesus takes the cross back from Simon. Where, where Jesus takes Simon's cross back, and as a result, he who knew no sin then became sin. Why? Why would he do that? So that he could ask you to do the same thing. Is he asking you to die on a cross of sin? No, he already did that. But so that he could fulfill his purpose. So that he could fulfill what, what God sent him to do. See, in this moment that Jesus took the cross back and that Jesus dies on the cross, he's actually carrying out the cross of purpose. He's not asking you to do something that he hasn't already done himself. By dying on the cross, he shows us what it is like, like to be a disciple, what it's like to, to do what God sent him to do. But while what happened on that Friday when, when Jesus was crucified is, is sad, and it's, and it's difficult, it's important to remember that the story doesn't end on Friday. Sunday's coming. Resurrection is coming. While what's difficult and the trials and the pains that come along with the cross that God's called you to carry can be difficult, it's important to remember that Sunday's coming. Resurrection is coming. And the pains of this world will not last forever. The, 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 this life is just a blink of an eye. The, the Sunday's coming. Resurrection is coming, and these pains will not last forever. Don't be discouraged when you go through hard things. Don't be discouraged when you go through trials, when you're fill, fulfilling your purpose, because remember, Sunday's coming. So I ask you, what, what's your purpose? What's your purpose? I wonder if you realize the importance of your purpose. Do you realize that, that God has you where you're at on purpose, for a purpose? That it's not by accident that you are created. That it's not by accident that you're in that workplace. That it's not by accident that you live in that, that neighborhood. It's not by accident that, that you're with the family you're with. Although some of you might wish like, man, I don't know if I'm supposed to be in this family. That's not by accident. God has you at where you're at on purpose, for a purpose. And then just a moment, I'm gonna ask if, if maybe today you're gonna make the greatest decision of receiving Jesus into your life, recognizing that he died on a cross to save you. And I'll give you a chance to respond, but maybe this morning you're saying, Jesus, I'm ready to fulfill the purpose that you've called me to. I, I've been stalling my calling, I, I've been partially obeying, and, and now it's time to fully obey. Now it's time to really start taking steps, whether that's finding a new job, whether that's going back to school, whether that's moving neighborhoods, whether that's whatever that looks like, reaching out to that person or to that family member, you're ready to start fulfilling that purpose. And maybe you're here this morning and you're like, hey, I've been fulfilling my purpose. I, I believe I'm right where God wants me. Well, that's great, but we can always ask God for more. How many here have, have kids or have had kids? Who know that kids like to ask questions? All right. I went to kids camp and found that out real quick. Kids love to ask questions. And I don't know if they aren't listening to the answer. I don't know if they forgot the answer, but what I think happens is they want a different answer, right? You didn't answer it the way that they wanted. And maybe you've gone through a scenario like this. You planned out your whole week of meals. You, you, went, you went grocery shopping, uh, you, you made the meals, you set the table, you put the food on the table, and your kid sits down and they ask the same question they ask every night. Do I have to eat all of it? He say, what do you say? Of course you have to eat all of it, right? What do you think? Your mom and I went grocery shopping to figure out how much food we could throw away this week, right? How American would it be to say, hey, you know what? You don't have to eat all of it. Let's order pizza. Let's drink some Mountain Dew, right? No, you say, of course you have to eat all of it. But how often in our walk with God is that what we ask God? God, do I have to do all of this? God, God do I have to do this? And God, I don't wanna, I don't wanna eat the green beans, God. I don't wanna eat the peas, God. I don't want the vegetables. But many times the things that you have been asking God for, the ingredients are sitting right there on your plate. And you're asking God for something over here and saying, listen, I'm giving you the ingredients. I'm giving you what you need, what, what you've been asking for. I don't wanna be the type of Christian that gets stuck at the table arguing the portion that I've been given. I wanna be the type of Christian that comes in saying, God, I want seconds. God, I want thirds. God, I want fourths. I want fifths. I want more. That's where we need to be. 
if you would bow your head and, and close your eyes this morning. And this morning as you sit here, you, you heard me talk about Jesus who came and he died for our sins. He, he, he fulfilled his purpose of saving us. And this morning, you, you're ready to be saved. You're, you're in a place where you've been struggling with, uh, with addictions. You're in a place where you've been struggling and you're ready to give your life over to God. You're ready to surrender to him. Say, God, I give you my life. And if that's you and you're ready to make the best decision you could ever make, would you raise your hand? No one's looking around, just between you and God and just so I can know who to pray for. I see your hands. I see them up all over. You can put them down. The next question is this. This morning, you're in this place, and, and as I talked about purpose, God began to lay something on your life, on your heart, on, for your life. And, and maybe it's something that, that you have already known for a long time. Maybe it's something new, but you realize, I have not been fulfilling my purpose. I have not been living out the purpose that God gave me. And this morning, I want to begin to walk in those steps. This morning, I want to begin to, to take the next steps to living out the purpose that God has for me. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Saying, I, I want to begin to live out the purpose God has for me. I see hands up all over. The last thing is this. This morning, you say, I'm in a place where I, I know I'm fulfilling my purpose. But I'm ready to ask God for even more. I'm ready, I'm ready to ask him for seconds and for thirds and for fourths. If that's you, would you raise your hand? See your hands. If you stand all across this room, I, I'm going to pray. And then when I say amen, if, if you raised your hand this morning for one of those things, I ask you to take a physical step of stepping out of your seat to go public with this. Whether that's to go public saying, I, I'm accepting Jesus, whether that's to go public saying, I want to start fulfilling my purpose or I want to ask God for more for my purpose. And when, we, when I say amen, they're going to begin to sing. You can come forward. If you're in a place where you're saying, you know what, I'm, I'm feeling really good right now with my purpose, but I want to go pray for that person. This is the time you can encourage your, your, your fellow members, the, the fellow people in our family. So I'm going to pray, and if that's you, you can come forward, and then we'll do something right after that before we're dismissed. Dear Jesus, God, I thank you for every person here, God, who made that decision to, to accept you into their life, God, who made the best decision they could ever make, God. I pray for those who, who are raising their hands and they want to begin to live out their purpose, God, that you would begin revealing them the next steps that you have for them, God, that you'd begin to open up doors for the way that you want them to go, that you would close the doors, God, that, that we would be able to tune out the haters, the, the people that are trying to bring us down, God, that we would come forward asking for seconds and for thirds, God. God, I pray you'd fill us up this morning, that we would leave here ready to be uncomfortable in the world, God, that we would come back here ready to be uncomfortable, that we would recognize that we are here to, to reach more people, Jesus. Give us a heart to reach others, God. We want more of you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.